All right. Good morning, everyone. I know uh, some of you love to you know hear the music, but for the past few Saturday schools, uh, the music hasn't hasn't been playing. So you know, while I thought I was you know a major DJ, right? Um, you know, everybody was like, "Why is Garrett talking like that?" You know, I don't even hear anything. So um, we'll get it started in just a little bit. I'm glad to see everybody um, coming in. 161 people um, today. Uh, registered uh, to hear about some real good stuff. So we'll give a few more minutes for uh, people to um, log on, uh, grab their coffee or get brunch or whatever the case may be and you know, come in. Uh, please introduce yourselves um, in the chat. Who are you? Where are you coming from? Some of, uh, um, some of you are some OGs, so uh, we know who you are, but still, um, you know, Introduce yourselves within the chat. Who you are, where you're coming from. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Go ahead and get settled as we are getting getting uh, everyone together. Good morning, Ariel. I'm so glad that you are joining us this morning. I will give another minute or so, a minute or so. Uh, please introduce yourselves in the chat, please. Uh, your name, where you're coming from. Donovan, you have a question uh, for um, today or anything like that? No question today? Greg, you have a question for today? Black history question for today? So in honor of our um, the 50th year in hip hop and teaching black history conference, uh, definitely, you can never go wrong with um, your top five rappers of all time. So if you want to participate in that, in the chat, please list your top five rappers of all time. This is a judgment-free zone, but I will look at you funny if you put vanilla ice. I will look at you funny if you put vanilla ice. I'm like, you know nothing about hip-hop. All right, we'll start in a few more seconds here. Let's go ahead and get settled. I forgot to tell you, uh, Doc, yeah, yeah, I'll do my first um, around five minutes, a little, little intro to various different things, and then we'll get you started. Um, we'll learn from you for about 30, 35 minutes, and then um, you know, our group loves to have questions and, and, and everything for our for our featured nerds. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Black History Nerds. Um, um, as we welcome our, um, you know, featured nerd, my name is LeGarrett King. I'm your HNIC, the head nerd in charge. Uh, so far, all our young people, um, half people are laughing, other people are not. And uh, one day I may mess up and slip up. But, you know, at the end of the day, I have not slipped up yet. Um, and I welcome you all um, to our Black History Nerds for um, April 1st, uh, 2023. Um so a few um, announcements before, before we get started. Um, remember our Teaching Black History Conference, our theme this year is the sounds of blackness, hip hop turns 50. Um, I do have the schedule and conference schedule already uh, set up. Registration, I promise, is coming up. We have to wait on the University of Buffalo to officially approve everything. So I'm just waiting on the University of Buffalo, but uh, hopefully we'll have this the 1st of April. Registration should be up. I know all the signatures have been signed and we're just waiting on the University of Buffalo to open up registration. 
registration for presenters will be a hundred dollars i believe 115 for um for attendees um please come out uh to buffalo we have a record number of um presentations this year we have 79 presentations that we have um going on for the teaching black history conference we're just waiting on registration and on our attendance so please pass the word um the date is july 21st through the 23rd we also uh before the teaching black history conference we have a writing retreat for scholars as well as uh, social studies coordinators retreat for social studies leaders, curriculum designers, teacher coaches, et cetera, et cetera, um, that we'll have before the conference. So I look forward to seeing uh, the hundreds of people in Buffalo this summer. Um, also, if you haven't been involved with our book club uh, for for this this semester, please join um, uh, Donovan. Is uh, I believe they've already had two um, book club sessions, and we're focusing on Born on the Water. Uh, and she's going through the teaching uh, manual, and I've been hearing some really great things uh, about the book club. And um, how many uh, people you have? Maybe, maybe around forty to fifty people. Yeah. Yeah. It's a yeah, really good group. Y'all should come and join us. Good stuff yeah. happening. All right, great, great. So you can register on the website um, for for the book club. So you have the link and everything, and they'll start back up next Saturday morning around this time as well. Um, Buffalo Public Schools, um, they're sponsoring students to go to Puerto Rico, and they are asking for any donations that you may um, make and give. Um, I believe they're asking for $25, and you'll get this nice little uh, pin uh, for your donation to send um, you know, a group of students, 9 through 12 students, to Puerto Rico to learn about themselves as well as their history. So this is a very important um, thing. Of course, travel is extremely important uh, for our students to get a global understanding of the world. Um, so please, um, if, if, if you can, there's the QR code down on the bottom right. You can scan that and donate um, monies to Buffalo Public Schools. Um, um, and I'll definitely put this also in our weekly um, email um, to you afterwards. Resource for the day, uh, Dr. Boyd's book, uh, Borderland Blacks, Two Cities in the Niagara Region During the Final Decades of Slavery. I really suggest that you uh, purchase this book. This is a wonderful book that talks about um, you know, the concepts of this area that, that we live now and, you know, how these particular places were, you know, situated with the abolitionist movements and, um, um, how Rochester, Buffalo and, and, uh, St. Catharines, right, um, in Ontario, uh, all kind of contributed to, um, uh, the final decades of slavery. So, uh, please purchase that book. Uh, Greg probably will put some links in the, um, chat for you all. And of course, baby, LSU, we're going to the chip, all right? LSU women's basketball, baby, LSU, LSU, LSU. All right now, so a uh, beautiful game on yesterday and a big upset um, in, in the second game, Iowa and South Carolina, where Iowa came through. So it looks like we're going to be uh, battling white Jesus um, as that girl was hooping. Like that girl, she can hoop. All right. So, uh, but, but LSU can hoop as well. So um, I look forward to um, enjoying Sunday, um, watching our girls play for um, uh, the championship. All right. So y'all hear me enough throughout um, all the time. Y'all, y'all not here to listen to me, but y'all are here uh, to focus on the Underground Railroad, the Black and the Greek, and the other spaces of slavery. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, let's give a hand to Dr. Daniel Boyd. All right, cheers all. Pull up my PowerPoint ready to go. Okay, here it is. All right, so cheers. I'm glad that you guys were able to join me. Um, this is my second time speaking at the, the University of Buffalo 
one time in person and this time virtually, uh, but nonetheless, I still feel like I'm back in Western New York. Um, so the title of my uh, talk today is The Underground Railroad, The Black Inner Geek in the Outer Spaces of Slavery. And so what the lecture will really highlight, it will explore the lens of Afrofuturism uh, to address new uh, dynamics of the Underground Railroad, detailing uh, the imagination, tact, and technology it took for fugitive Blacks to, free, to flee uh, to the outer spaces of slavery. Uh, the talk addresses the intersections of race, technology, and liberation by retroactively applying a modern-day concept, Afrofuturism, Afro uh, to historical Black moments. And so what I'll do is this, this talk really combines, it's an amalgamation of three of my uh, publications. Um, the first two being uh, the Underground Railroad as Afrofuturism, which was featured uh, both as an article and a book chapter. Um, and also I'll, I'll highlight uh, at the very end of the talk, um, my book by LSU Press, uh, Borderland uh, Blacks. So to begin with, uh, looking at the article and chapter, uh, The Underground Railroad as Afrofuturism, basically what I do is I ask three major questions um, in this article uh, slash chapter. Um, I ask the question of were uh, enslaved Blacks Afrofuturists? Um, how can Afrofuturism be used uh, to grasp the tangible Underground Railroad network in its attached American mythology? And the last question I ask is, um, how does the Underground Railroad comprehensively mix modernity, fairy tale, and actual movement of Black fugitives? So these are the questions that I'm grappling with um, in this uh, article slash uh, chapter. But I guess the first thing that we have to do is define what is Afrofuturism before we really talk about the Underground Railroad and we talk about the Black inner geek and the outer spaces of slavery. So what is Afrofuturism? Um, the term uh, Afrofuturism was developed in North America and subsequently uh, spread throughout the African diaspora. It was coined by our author and cultural uh, critic Mark Derry and an interview that he conducted uh, with Samuel uh, Delaney, the late great uh, Greg Tate, and Trissa Rose, and they titled uh, that, that interview, uh, Black to the Future. Um, basically, what they're, they're dealing with, with Afrofuturism, it, is it really interrupts uh, the mainstream and canonized uh, science fiction, um, liberating Blacks from kind of non-existence and background uh, position. So basically, when you read science fiction in the past, it was as if Black people didn't make it to the future, or people of color or women. And so it was just like, you know, we're going to make it to the future. And that's what Afrofuturism really does, is it intervenes and say, like, we'll be there too, right? <laughs> like the future is just not all white. Right. Um, and so that's what science fiction really looked like before. Uh, but Afrofuturists uh, started to kind of intervene and say that, no, you know, Black people are going to be there. We shouldn't be subject to kind of non existence and background uh, positions. I really like the way uh, Mark Derry uh, deals with this. He says that science fiction was a boys' club. Uh, girls keep out, Black and Hispanics and the poor in general go away, right? I mean, that that was the future, right? And so what Afrofuturism does is it intervenes, if you will, on behalf uh, of Black people and say that we're going to be there too. The other thing about Afrofuturism is this developed by Mark Derry, who is a white man, right? And so people, you know, are saying like, you know, but the people that he are, he's interviewing are Black, right? Uh, Samuel Delaney, Greg Tate, of course, um, and Trisha Rose are, are Black individuals. And so, and two, just because he's coming up with the, the name Afrofuturism does not mean that Afrofuturism didn't exist, if you will, already, right? It's kind of like, you know, before John Newton, there was gravity, right? Before Karl Marx, right, there was, you know, economic determinism, right? And so just because they name it doesn't mean that it, it doesn't already exist. So, you know, Mark Derry just coined it, right? But Afrofuturism um, had been something that was playing out over time and space and throughout, you know, Black art, literature, uh, music, 
um, et cetera. Really since the beginning of modern technology and science um, at the beginning of the, the 19th century. And this is what I'm arguing too with the Underground Railroad. Black people really kind of understood that technology um, of what the, the railroad could do for them and expediting them to freedom uh, out of the American South. Also too, um, you know, well before the 1990s, Sun Ra, George Clinton, Octavia Butler, I mean, these are Afrofuturists, right? Um, and so, you know, don't give, you know, don't look uh, too much at the coining of the name, but Afrofuturism was already in existence, right? And there's several definitions of, of Afrofuturism that you can get. Um, I always say that it engages the past um, in the present um, to kind of visualize a future through a Black cultural lens, right? That's what I think is the kind of best definition. The other thing is that it looks at these kind of real world uh, problems and imagine a better future uh, for these, these things. Um, I really like uh, what Yatasha Walmack uh, says is that, you know, really Afrofuturism is a lens, it's a way of looking uh, at the future and alternate realities through a Black cultural lens. And she says this happens through, you know, imagination, technology, Black culture, liberation, and mysticism. Um, and so she also uh, says that, you know, Afrofuturism plays out through um, artistic um, aesthetic, uh, which we will talk about in just a minute, um, and also um, through modes of uh, self-liberation and self-healing, right? And so there's several ways that Afrofuturism can kind of play out over time and space. And we're just looking at, you know, some of the aspects of artistic um, aesthetic, you know, Sun Ra. We have to start with Sun Ra, who said he was from Saturn, like literally, right? Uh, individuals like uh, George Clinton, right? Um, and George Clinton, you know, with, with his parliament and the, the Funkadelics and the mothership connection, uh, basically saying he wanted to bring down the mother, mothership to rescue Black people from Earth and take them up to space, right? Earth must be an awful place if you want to rescue Black people and take them to space, right? But also individuals like Janelle Monet, who, you know, has these themed albums that kind of really tell a story and a narrative uh, throughout them but also to the visual arts, right? Like uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat, right? Um, really bringing street um, graffiti, if you will, to the fine art galleries, right? Um, so he's looked at as a visual artist that is an Afro-futurist. Uh, if we're looking at dance, for example, I mean, in the 1970s, Black people were doing the robot and they didn't even have robots, right? They didn't even have computers, right? But they're doing the robot. And, you know, of course, Michael Jackson at the uh, Motown 25 anniversary, he's doing the moonwalk, right? Uh, you, you know what I mean? Like Black people hadn't even been to the moon yet, right? Um, and so all of these things are, are, are expressions of Afrofuturism, right? Um, and then through movies, um, I'm thinking about Will Smith that starred in a, a bunch of uh, sci-fi movies, um, such as Independence Day, Men in Black, iRobot, um, et cetera, well before uh, Black Panther, right? And so it plays out in film um, over time and space and also literature uh, with Octavia Butler. Um, Kindred has been made into a miniseries in 2022 um, uh, and people um, like Coastin Whitehead with the, the Underground Railroad, you know, really, you know, having Black people take real trains on this, this Underground Railroad. Uh, uh, Yatasha Wilmack also talks about, you know, Afrofuturism as a mode of liberation and healing. Um, so she talks about using imagination to transition or to transcend um, circumstances um, and also um, imagining oneself um, in the future creates agency, right? Uh, I, I often, you know, talk to my students about this, you know, if you kind of going through the minutia of college, um, it's very difficult sometimes, but if you can imagine I'm going to be a professor, I'm going to be a doctor, right? It's the future that kind of drives you, right? That is self-liberating and kind of self-healing from the pain you're currently going through. So also enslaved people, uh, having them to think about and imagine a free future, right? You're enslaved in the Carolinas and you're thinking about, you know, that there's free Black people in the state of Connecticut or in Canada, 
right? And in a sense, you have time travel once you reach Connecticut or Canada because there's Black people living free, right? Um, and, and so, you know, imagination, you know, to transcend the kind of current circumstances is interesting. So how do most people know Afrofuturism? Because of Black Panther in 2018. And this is, I'm guilty of this too. I started writing The Underground Railroad as Afrofuturism because of this movie. I literally went home after uh, seeing the movie in Canada and started to write uh, that article uh, and book chapter. Um, and so this is how most people get introduced to Afrofuturism in 2018, right? And two, the last fight uh, between um, T'Challa and Killmonger is happening as, as, as trains are kind of racing by them. So it's kind of invoking the Underground Railroad, which is really interesting. And then, of course, Black Panther of Wakanda Forever in 2022 has kind of continued the conversation of Afrofuturism. I really like Afrofuturism because it's like a new space for Black scholarly invention, right? Um, you have to understand that futurism had always kind of gone on, but what um, Afrofuturism does is it creates the kind of cultural lens and the Black culture to future, right? There's also things like Afro-pessimism, right? So we, pessimism has been around, but now Black people are starting to say, hey, you know, we're pessimistic too, right? We can, we can add our own cultural uh, element uh, to this, right? And minimal minimalism, right? So Afro minimalism, right? With Christina Platt, right? So she's talking about, you know, how, you know, can we learn to live with less, if you will, and it's kind of a critique of capitalism, right? And so Black people are just kind of adding their cultural lens um, to these concepts because our cultural lens is very important and we see things differently uh, than other people see them using these larger concepts, right? Um, which is interesting. And then there's just like cool things that happen in Afrofuturism, which I love, like Beth Coleman basically saying race is technology, right? Yeah. She recognizes that race has been used as machinery constructed and institutionalized as machinery to entangle and oppress Black people. So she calls race, you know, not really a trait, she calls it a technology, right? And she says the kind of machinery of race is not you know, uh, material or wooden contraption, but rather it functions systematically. Indeed, race has tool-like properties, right? Uh, that manifest through groups, governments, practices, and laws, right? And so I really like this concept because we've been talking about race as a social construct and things of that nature. But when you think about it, race is really technical, right? It determines where you live. It determines what type of schools you go to, right? You know, I mean, this is this is a technical kind of scientific thing. Race is right, and she says to really deconstruct the apparatus of race as technology. People have to rewire thoughts and actions into circuit breakers um, of change in new spaces uh, because subtract, subtract, subtractions uh, do not multiply into equality, right? And so, I mean, it's really really kind of a different approach uh, to race, right? Uh, looking at it as a technology. Some Afrofuturism, uh, Afrofuturists uh, say that everything is a technology, right? And so race, of course, kind of fits um, as a, an actual technology. The other thing I really like about Afrofuturism, like technology, is it continues to kind of upgrade itself, right? And it's uh, really attuned to the kind of, um, agents of, of change, right? And so now, you know, you have, you know, Afrofuturism, but now people are talking about African futurism and even Afro-Southern futurism, right? And so it just continues to kind of upgrade itself, you know, cultural uh, analytics, aesthetics, um, you know, visual uh, studies, uh, speculative uh, philosophy is kind of dealing with uh, Afrofuturism. Um, Afrofuturism also challenges isms, racism, um, colonialism, sexism, and a wealth of other exploitative uh, isms. I really like um, the concert uh, Afropunk. And, that, and in the concert uh, Afropunk, which happens in, in Brooklyn, I think Atlanta's had one, South Africa, 
uh, Paris, London have had uh, Afropunk uh, concerts. They talk about before you come in that there's going to be no sexism, racism, ableism, and things of that nature. And basically, that's the future I want to live in. I don't want any of these things in the future. We shouldn't allow these things to come into the future future, right? Like these things are bad, right? Um, and so I really like that concept. Like the future looks like this. We don't have racism. We don't have, I mean, I can get in, I can get down with this future, right? Like this is the future I want to be a part of, right? Count me in, like get me in this concert because none of these things will be there, right? Um, and so I really like that, um, that basically um, what Afrofuturism is saying is that we need to kind of, you know, get away from these things um, because this is futuristic. The other thing that Afrofuturists are doing are talking about, you know, Black History Month is a thing, but they're talking about Black Futures Month, right? Or Black Future Month. Um, so basically kind of talking about uh, what Black people look like in the future. Um, and so, you know, I'm a historian, so this kind of seemed to me like ahistorical, but I, I get exactly what they're what they're talking about here is that we not only need to focus on you know the history of Black people, but also focus on where we're going. So a lot of Afrofuturists, they call Black History Month, um, you know, Afrofuture Month, right? Um, and of course, you have the book, How Long Into you know, Black Future Month, right? Um, and so these are just great concepts. I really like what Afrofuturism is doing um, as, a, as a concept over time and space, right? And then you also have the exhibit um, at the National Museum for African American History and Culture that just opened up um, on Afrofuturism, a future, uh, a history of Black futures. And so it features um, a lot of uh, items um, that involve uh, Afrofuturism. And I think this is kind of a high point, if you will, of Afrofuturism being uh, featured uh, at the museum uh, in Washington, DC, right? So if you guys have time, uh, check, out, check out that exhibit. Um, and so the thing that is really interesting about Afrofuturism in history is that if we can you know, create a vision um, of the future, why can't we create, create a new vision uh, of the past, right? And this transformed history from being merely events that occurred in the past to a record that really guides the future. Um, I always say that we have to have a usable history. We have to have a history that we can kind of use to propel ourselves forward, right? And this is how I really like to use uh, Afrofuturism. Now, let me get into Afrofuturism in the Underground Railroad. I'll go over you know, three concepts. Basically, I'll talk about the Underground Railroad. I'll talk about this concept that I talk about in the article uh, called the Black Inner Geek. And also, I'll talk about the outer spaces of slavery. So we, we all kind of know the Underground Railroad. Um, really, the Underground Railroad, the kind of saying, uh, the coin phrase of the Underground Railroad comes from from uh, Tice Davis, uh, who ran off across the Ohio River, and his uh, owner said he must have, you know, taken off on some underground railroad. But all of the tropes of the actual railroad, which is the most modern technology of that given time. Remember that the railroads start running um, in the United States in 1830. I think the first railroad ran from Baltimore out to the, the Midwest, right? Um, and so they use all of the kind of techie terms of the Underground Railroad um, as, as double talk uh, to really kind of highlight, you know, what they're doing. So they use tracks, stations, DOPs, conductors, agents, station masters, et cetera, right? And these are really techie terms for that time, right? And so, you know, this kind of gets to the question, are enslaved Black people Afrofuturists? I would say they are, right? They're using all these kind of new modern uh, techie terms uh, to facilitate uh, them uh, to freedom, right? So historically, the Underground Railroad has really been clouded by misconceptions of secret quilts, uh, hidden, you know, passageways and doorways that did not exist. Um, also, um, the kind of uh, 
concept of what Canada was, this promised land, and also oral histories that were retold over time and space that were not actually validated. So there's a lot of kind of mysticism that happens with the Underground Railroad as well. The other thing is, is that, you know, the Underground Railroad has to happen underground, right? They don't want it to be an above ground railroad. So to actually study the Underground Railroad is very difficult because you've got to have to get at the hints and clues of what Black people are doing uh, to facilitate themselves uh, to the American North, um, you know, to the Caribbean, uh, to uh, Europe or back to Africa, right? Um, and so, you know, the Underground Railroad, we've, we've all seen these uh, maps of the Underground Railroad. Uh, this is um, an important part of the Niagara Underground Railroad Trail that I highlight in Borderland Blacks. Uh, that is important to my research, but you can also see uh, that the Underground Railroad, you know, goes to the Caribbean, it goes to Mexico um, and other places uh, besides the uh, American North. And so there, you know, starting in the 1960s, you know, historians really started to challenge uh, the notions that the Underground Railroad was a well-organized network of devoted conductors and secret codes. Uh, this is because a lot of Black people are starting to enter um, the academy and starting to kind of really break down what the Underground Railroad truly was. The assistance to Black runaways by white sympathizers was quite limited uh, due to the fragmented character of the Underground Railroad. Uh, plus, members of the Underground Railroad did not view themselves as a part of an organized conspiracy, but really just individuals that are acting out of chair. Um, so a lot of, you know, you know, people that are helping out with the, the Underground Railroad, they're really just acting out of charity. You're in Rochester, you're trying to figure out how to get to Buffalo. They're just kind of pointing you in the right direction, um, right? I always say, you know, um, you know, if you're on the interstate in, in New York and you stop to help somebody change the tire, you're not a part of AAA or any roadside assistance. You're just helping out somebody out of goodwill that is on, stuck on the side of the road. So you're not a part of any organized roadside assistant program. And that's what most of the people that are doing that are helping out Blacks. The other thing is, you have to understand that the Underground Railroad is really Black people helping Black people. Like if you were a Black runaway from the American South, would you really sleep in a white person's house? Perhaps, you know, perhaps you'll sleep there for a while and get up and, and run away before they wake up, right? Or you take some food. But generally, this is, you know, Black people helping out Black people. And a lot of, you know, Black people had not even heard of uh, the Underground Railroad. So really, the attention in the Underground Railroad was really focused um, on the abolitionists and not on the fugitive uh, themselves, when the fugitive is really playing the key role um, in, you know, the perpetration of running away uh, for their own freedom. Whereas before the 1960s, all of the focus was on, you know, the abolitionists that were helping out um, the, the fugitives, right? And so in actuality, Black people did not have help through the most critical part of the journey, which was the American South, right? Um, that was the hardest part, right? And so, you know, however, you know, the helpless fugitive was more attractive to the Northern consciousness um, than the self-determined aggressive fugitives. Southerners actually believe their own mythology. It must be those, those damn abolitionists, right? Um, and those, those Yankees that are causing Black people to get away and not the fugitives themselves. Black people are not smart enough to get to Canada by themselves. They must be getting help from white abolitionists, those Yankees, right? Um, so they, they almost believe their own mythology, right? That Black people are too stupid to get out of en enslavement, right? Uh, that is until they can't find them, right? And then, and then they realize that, you know, these people have gotten away. So for me, you know, I look at slave resistance um, from kind of the least threatening to the most threatening. And I really categorize slave resistance in kind of four uh, categor categories. Um, the most widespread was, you know, hostility um, that slaves uh, did day to day, the kind of silent sabotage, hidden transcript of resistance, doing poor work, breaking tools, abusing animals, theft of food, pretending to be ill, overall disrupting the plantation routine and causing low productivity. And so this happened every day. Black people, you know, people always say, you know, how were Black people were resisting? They're resisting every day. It's kind of like the workforce today. You know, some people say that the workforce, the American workforce is not resisting. I would argue that they are. 
because, you know, doing poor work, you know, basically, you know, calling in sick when you're not sick. I mean, that's that's basically silent sabotage, the hidden transcript of resistance um, for teachers letting out your class early. Right. If you work at a coffee shop, giving your friends, you know, free coffee when they come in. Right. If you work at a pizza shop, taking, you know, pies home at the end of the night, that is the most widespread form of kind of resistance. Um, and, and, and really, everybody does this. If you take home stationary, you know, from your job, you're not really supposed to be doing that. But you do it anyway, right? Uh, you know, the university has pens, right? They won't mind if I, if I take a couple, right? And so, you know, enslaved people are doing this as well. They're constantly doing poor work, pretending to be ill, you know, disrupting this kind of plantation routine, right? Um, less frequent, but more dangerous were serious crimes committed by slaves. This is a, these are always one-on-one -on -one to one-on-few. -on -few. These included arson, uh, poisoning, uh, armed assault of individual whites. Um, and so, you know, Frederick Douglass got in a fight with this guy, Edward Covey, that was a slave breaker. Um, and really, you know, we kind of think he gets away with it because they know that, you know, basically Frederick Douglass is related uh, to the family that he's in, he's uh, a slave too. This is, you know, um, a woman working in the kitchen and slips master a Mickey, right? She poisons him through his food, right? So this is less frequent, but more dangerous, but really it only happens on a one-to-one to one to few basis, right? So this is like if you work for a company, uh, put in in modern day terms, and you find out that women are getting underpaid. So the women sue the company, right? It doesn't help everybody, but it helps the women in the company, right? Or African-Americans find out that a, a particular uh, organization or a company is not paying them correctly and they file a lawsuit. It doesn't help everybody, but it can help individuals kind of on an individual basis. But when people are looking for slave revolts, they're really looking for mass slave insurrections. But these things happen so rarely, right? Um, and so to me, and you can see Gamal Prasser, you know, Denmark Vesey is really interesting. This guy wins the lotto on the Caribbean, goes to South Carolina and plans a slave insurrection, right? I don't know if I hit the Powerball, would I be planning the next revolution in America? Denmark Vesey is absolutely exceptional, right? And then Nat Turner's successful uh, slave rebellion that happens in August um, of 18. 31. But generally, too, everybody that's involved with these slave insurrections, they're all executed afterwards, right? And even the people that are suspected of being involved. And so really what I say is that running away is the most threatening part of owning slaves, right? It's the nuisance of the earth. It's the dust of the earth. It's hard to keep a hold to, you know, Jimmy the Black Slave. You can't always keep an eye on him, right? And so he slips off. And two, unlike three, uh, with these mass insurrections, it only takes one individual to get away, right? And an individual like Frederick Douglass is worth $40,000 in today's money. So, I mean, him slipping off is not something you want to happen as an owner, right? And so, and two, I, I, I really like calling Black people self-stolen property. You don't even own yourself. You stole you. But how does that happen? What does that even mean? You don't even own you. Like, and so really, you know, I look at the Underground Railroad and running off as the highest form of slave insurrection, right? But I also say it's important to understand, number one, because Black people are resisting every day. They're resisting every day. Um, and so, but the highest form of slave insurrection is the Underground Railroad and really running off. I want to talk a bit about the Black inner geek and so, you know, Black people really couldn't show how the intelligent they were in enslavement. They, you know, um, they were not supposed to be able to learn how to read and write. And so, you know, the thing is, is that their, their ears are always keen to kind of instruments and agents of movement and change, right? And so what the Underground Railroad proves is kind of the intelligence that is embedded in Black people that they cannot show, right? And I'm thinking about how this kind of played out in my high school. In my high school, I didn't want to show how intelligent I was because, you know, you were a target, right? Today, you know, it's cool to be a geek. You know, my, my nieces and nephews are, are pretty nerdy and it's cool, right? 
But back in my day, you know, I had to use that black inner geek you know, because it was like, you know, I'm smart, but I, I really can't show it. <laughs> that could be a problem, right? And so enslaved people have the same dilemma, right? They can't show how intelligent they are, but running away really kind of proves that intelligence. So the black inner geek rescues the enslaved people from the stereotypes of being technophobes and asserts that they could keep pace with the techno culture if they were not high tech hijacked. Right. Um, and two, they want to use the trains, right? Instead of taking, you know, the horse of flesh and blood, they can take the iron horse that will, you know, expediently get them out of enslavement. So if there's a quicker way to get out of enslavement, black people would take a spaceship out of enslavement. They'll take anything, right? And so they're looking for trains and they're looking for steamships and these forms of new technology that can expedite them out of the American South as quick as possible, right? Everybody wants to harness technology to kind of make their lives easier, right? Um, and so fugitives, you know, really, you know, we're looking at this uh, technology as something that, you know, could help uh, expedite them, you know, out of enslavement. And it was really an important part of what they were trying to do um, as they're moving uh, towards uh, freedom. I think one great example of that is Henry Box Brown. Uh, Henry uh, Box Brown is is going to mail himself uh, to freedom um, in uh, 1949. He will put himself in this box uh, with the help of some conspirators um, and basically ship himself uh, to freedom, right? And so this is a great example of thinking outside of the box, right? And Express Mail had literally just came out, right? And so this guy, you know, Box Brown, he, he Amazon himself to freedom, right? He Amazon prided himself to freedom. I mean, this is what he did, right? He understood that Express Mail had just got started and he harnessed the power of Express Mail uh, to get himself, to mail himself um, from uh, Richmond, Virginia to Philadelphia. That's amazing, right? And Frederick Douglass was actually mad at him because, you know, he, he publishes his narrative and tells like how he, you know, meld himself to freedom. And Frederick Douglass was saying, like, do you know how many other people could have meld themselves to freedom if you didn't write that narrative, right? You know what I mean? Like, what are you doing, right? Like, this, this could have been a, a way we can get a lot of people out of enslavement, right? Um, and so, again, this is harnessing the most modern technology uh, for the liberation uh, of himself, right? Um, and I think about like how social media has been used with like Black Lives Matter and stuff like that to organize protests. That's harnessing the technology uh, to get the results uh, that you that you really want. Um, and so the last concept that I really talk about is the outer spaces of slavery. Sometimes the outer spaces uh, of slavery, you know, um, it's any place that is outside of the American South. It can be the American North, uh, Canada, Africa. Um, Europe, uh, places in the Caribbean or, or elsewhere. Um, sometimes, ironically, the outer spaces of slavery existed right in the American South, for instance, the Dismal Swamp or the Florida Ever Everglades. Um, and also, too, there's large uh, free Black communities in New Orleans, right? And so sometimes people just, you know, went to New Orleans and hit amongst the free Black people, and they found this kind of outer spaces of slavery right within the South, right? Or Charleston, uh, South Car Carolina. And so in all, you know, Blacks wanted to really reshape all spaces to be the outer spaces of slavery, right? And two, you know, you know, what is it like, like, when you're enslaved in Georgia and you reach like New York City, right? It, it, to this day, when you go to Times Square, there's people from like the Midwest that are in New York City and they're just like looking around. It's like they're almost dazed by like the futurism that is going on in New York City, right? And so, you know, you know, for people, for Black people to come out of enslavement and to go to these new spaces where there is no slavery, that's like a whole new world. That's a whole new world. What, like, I have to learn how to, like, exist in this world. And Frederick Douglass talks about how, basically, en enslavers wanted to make their power seem boundless, right? They wanted it to seem boundless so that you can never reach the outer spaces of slavery, right? That's what they wanted to do uh, to enslave people. Uh, but places without slavery was the cosmos. And uh, fugitives had, an, you know, 
in many ways um, had time travel when they abided within these spaces, right? And so these regions, these nations, you know, for their, their legal um, emancipation, uh, they still, you know, had issues, uh, racial, being racially coarse, um, you know, having segregation and also being alienating uh, to Black people. And so Black people, even when they reached the outer spaces of slavery, they had to kind of navigate around the Black holes and find the stars, right? So there, there's still issues just because you reached the outer spaces of slavery does not mean that, you know, racism is not in those spaces, right? And so it's not all, you know, great when you reach the outer spaces of slavery, right? You still have to navigate the black holes and find the stars. I really like what Sun Ra says. He says that space is not only high, it's low, it's the bottomless, there is no end. And that's racism, right? Um, racism, you know, exists you know, in these high and kind of low spaces, right? And so we only think of space sometimes as being high. We know it's above. But also space has black holes, right? You got to be careful of those too, right? Those, those are issues, right? In space, you don't want to fall out one of those, right? And so black people are still navigating things um, even in the outer spaces of slavery. And so this all sounds like very conceptual. And what I do in Borderland Blacks is I make it very practical. I just show that, hey, black people are using these railroads. They're using the suspension bridges. They're using steam power they're arriving in these major metropoles, right? And so, you know, it's all magical realism until you kind of ground it in something that actually really happens as an historian. That's what I'm really trying to do in Borderland Blacks is to say that when we tend to think about enslaved people, we think of them as being void of kind of technology. They're just some backwoods Black people that are working cotton fields, sugar fields, right? But they're sophisticated. They understand modern technology and they're trying to harness it, right? And so I talk about these kind of fugitive technologies and even using the North Star. I mean, it's very futuristic, right? Um, and the things that they're doing to kind of dress to look that they're free, writing passes, right? Um, rubbing um, um, red uh, onion on their feet and spruce pine to throw off dogs, right? I mean, this is really interesting. That, that takes some type of technology. That's fugitive technology. And two, you know, me kind of being a, a city slicker, I don't know how to do these things. You put me in the woods, I'm like, I, uh, good luck, right? I don't have these technology. I can't, I can't do much in the woods. Like, you know what I mean? That ain't for me. Like, you know, you give me a city, I can navigate that, right? And so, you know, I, I use the suspension bridges that are really important, the Niagara Falls suspension bridge that adds railroad uh, tracks uh, to the Ni Niagara Falls suspension bridge in 1855. And so Blacks could literally take the train to Canada. I mean, isn't that futuristic, right? They're, they're working, you know, fills in the American South and they wind up taking a train across a suspension bridge to Canada. I mean, that's pretty futuristic, right? Um, and so um, an outro, I know a black techno thriller solved the ultimate algorithm, slavery, a calculated subtraction that did not figure them into the equation, right? And this goes back to like Beth Coleman and race as technology. It's really technical to get out of enslavement. It's an algorithm, right? They have means to get you back. Right? You know what I mean? Like you, you got to be careful, right? Um, and so enslaved people were not void of technology or, or simply primitive, unskilled laborers. Uh, they were driven by the chronicles of progress. They were curious. Uh, they looked to take advantage of technology um, as tools to make their good away uh, less troublesome and quicker. So, you know, the less trouble that they can get themselves in or the quicker that they can get themselves to freedom, they want to use. Uh, so by wearing these kind of low-tech masses, uh, they were able to discreetly decipher complex codes and usher themselves to the outer spaces of slavery using the latest technology and gadgetry. Um, and so Black fugitives recognized a free future was possible and they could be teleported through modern technology. This makes them some of the most innovative, astute, cutting edge modernists of their time. Black people had the least resources, but were the most resourceful with the little information and tools they could muster up clandestinely. Um, by maximizing steam power and other man-made uh, machinery, they carried themselves away from the clutches of bondage. Uh, black runaways 
uh, considered uneducated, unskilled, backwards, shiftless, amongst many other things, maneuvered and managed to ride modern uh, transportation uh, to transform and invent futures, uh, their uh, slave pursu pursuers wanted to switch off. However, Blacks were state of the art and light years ahead of what was expected. Um, the fugitive uh, knew that the point of slavery was to technically unplug and to power down their ability to use technology. Just like in the past, the digital divide um, today is designed to keep Black people uninformed and as a technological underclass, which reduces their autonomy. If you don't have access to technology today, it's going to reduce your freedom, right? And so Black people identify that in enslavement, that they had to get access to this technology because they could, you know, get out of slavery faster. And two, it would enhance their freedom if they have access to it. Thank you very much. All right, let's let's give Dan a a hand um, for this wonderful presentation. Um, learned a lot uh, about the concepts of Afrofuturism. Learned a lot about history and the ways in which we can kind of analyze history a little bit different. Um, so let's open it up. Um, let's see. How can I get the view with everybody here? Um, I know there was some questions or some conversations within the uh, chat here. Uh, I see Daniel's hand is raised. Daniel, you want to ask, ask a question? Yeah, thank you. Hey, thank you so much for that that fantastic presentation. I just ordered your book on Amazon Prime. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I just have a quick question. I don't know too much about this space, but aside from yourself and, and your book and your work, for somebody who's just, you know, sinking their teeth into this, are there some books or articles or some scholars that, that you recommend starting off with to get a good grasp of, of Afrofuturism? Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good question. I'm just uh, looking through my presentation um, here because there's one that uh, a book that just came out uh, called Afrofuturism, uh, History of Black Futures. And it's basically, um, it's paired with the Afrofuturism exhibit at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And it's actually as a combination to the exhibit, right? So it's a book that, you know, kind of highlights the exhibit as well. And it came out right around the same time um, of the exhibit opening up just last week. And so I would recommend that book, um, Afrofuturism, A History of Black Futures. It's by uh, the last name, the two editors uh, of the edition are uh, Straight and uh, Corn Will uh, are the editors for that. And it has all of the, the best, you know, uh, Afrofuturists in their modern, if you will, kind of uh, interventions um, of Afrofuturism. So I haven't even gotten that book yet. I need to order it myself. So, so it just came out. So that's what I would recommend uh, to everybody. Um, and I think I can put it in the chat here too. I'll just uh, put it in the chat so everybody has. It. I think Greg's gonna um, put in a tad dance. So um, just just focus on our nerds here. Here, uh, all right. <laughs> um, Marilyn, you, you put something um, interesting in the chat about passing. You want to ask ask that particular question or uh, conversational piece? Yes, um, you were talking about um, Beth Coleman's book, Racist Technology. I'd never heard of that before, but I was thinking as you were talking, if we view race that way, could we look at something like passing, whether we agree with it or not, as being, you know, an innovation that some people were able to take advantage of to make their lives better, you know, in terms of futures? Yeah, and so uh, Beth Coleman, it's uh, actually an article, Race as Technology. Uh, Beth Coleman, phenomenal uh, scholar that I think teaches at the University of Toronto uh, right now. Uh, but yeah, I, I do think, I mean, Afrofuturism, they call everything technology. So, you know, I mean, yes, they look at like passing um, and even too in this concept of the Underground Railroad, it works um, because um, 
uh, Ellen Craft uh, is going to, you know, pass as white, um, as a white slaveholder uh, with her husband and lead them uh, to freedom, right? And so, yes, it can be used um, as a mechanism uh, to kind of get freedom or to do whatever you want to do with, with passing, right? Um, but it is a way, if you will, to kind of circumvent, you know, situations and to get around uh, things that perhaps you want to avoid um, as a racialized uh, uh, person. Um, and so, so yeah, and so they look at everything like as, as a, an actual uh, technology. Um, and so passing could be used uh, as, as the mechanism as well. Yeah. Um, I saw in the comments, uh, I believe Grace says she never heard of the story of Henry Box Brown. Um, there's a really um, good children's book that um, talks about Henry Box Brown. Donovan, if you can put that in the chat for us, I would definitely appreciate that. Um, also, um, I didn't read uh, throughout, but I, but I did see in the chat that there were some conversations about quilts um, and their uh, relationship to uh, freedom, but let's take Ms. Barbara's uh, question first before we get into the uh, uh, quilts conversation. You know, I know a lot about what you're saying, not the terms you are using, and I wondered how some of my relatives ended up in Canada. Family will not discuss a lot of things. And now I understand that they didn't all stop in the North, but they kept going to be sure to be out of this country for good. And yes, quilts were used because I came from a family of quilt makers and quilts were part of it. They, just like you said, I've never heard it stated so Oh, I can't even think of a word so so well to say that we were not ignorant people trying to escape or satisfy with our situation, but we were intelligent people with working minds and technology that was even ahead of our own time to help us to come to freedom. We were not passive slaves, but we were active freedom holders. And I will mute myself. No, and that's that's the thing. You know, generally slaves are think are thought of as being low tech. They really are. Like oh, they, they don't have access to tech. Like they, you know, they just ran away. Like no, they were they were trying to get on the trains too, right? If it's if it's faster and easier, and I got to walk through you know fields and you know ponds and things, I I want to use the train as well. Steam power, right? I mean, going up the Atlantic coast, right? A lot of black people are gonna use steam power to get free, right? Um, and so we really have to make these black people, you know, really apply technology to what they're doing. And also too, even the things that are kind of considered untechnical of even running through, um, you know, the countryside. It takes a type of technology to really read the landscape, to know what's going on, to find the berries you can eat, to find the ones that are poor. I mean, these are that's a technology to really to know how to use the North Star. I don't even know where the North Star is half of the time. You know what I mean? I can't look up and like I did it. Like that's a you have to really know what you're doing, right? You know, and so I, I can I can find the North Star, you know. You, a lot of this was knowledge obtained from our ancestors still in us. So people think it's new things, but a lot of this was from our ancestors and they have been retained and passed down, but we don't know it. I'm going to mute. Yeah. And, and this, I think that's important to say because, you know, many Black people, you know, Black people in Africa had knowledge of the North Star. They just act like the North Star was new to Black people in the American South. No, they, they knew about the North Star. But, you know, Black people and all people have been looking up to the stars for generations, right? I mean, so they, they know about the North Star, right? And then they're just kind of applying it to their current situation in the American South, where really that's African knowledge, right? Um, and, and so that just kind of gets carried over and passed on, like you said. Yeah, you know, what's really interesting is the way in which we frame the Underground Railroad or frame the various different conductors or Harriet Tubman as people who had a desire, right? Like, oh, they, they just had this grit, this desire to get free. And I'm just like, well, Tubman went back and forth. However, you know, how the historians want to argue how many times she went back and forth. But at the end of the day, she never got caught. Yeah, so that takes some intelligence 
right? You know, to actually have her name out in them streets, right? <laughs> like, hey, you know, we need to get this protected person and she continues to do this and never get caught. That takes a level of intelligence that, you know, many of us cannot even, um, you know, phantom. Yeah. It's hard to be a fugitive, right? You got to be a good fugitive. I mean, it's hard. <laughs> how do you, how do you even stay Even with a brain injury through her travels, she still had that level of intelligence, super intelligence from her ancestors. Mute. <laughs> uh, any other questions? <laughs> any other questions or comments or thoughts? Yeah, so I just wanted to say that I'm a first grade teacher and when I teach about the Underground Railroad and I have a, a, a uh, a friend that comes in and she has the different quilt, uh, the messages explained in her quilt that she did. And I always teach them that I, yes, the, the slaves weren't taught to read and write, but we were, they were taught survival skills and how to escape on that L underground railroad. And that I would have taught my kids those things. But another great book is called Barefoot. It's a great, and it, and it shows how the animals helped the slaves um, go. And another, um, I can't think, I'm not at home, I'm visiting my parents or else I would pull it. But there's another one about, and a, and a doll tells this story. But there are a lot of great books out there about that Underground Railroad. Thank you, thank you. You're um, welcome. Any other questions, comments, or thoughts? Uh, yeah. People, uh, um, people yeah, I use... would like to. Go ahead, yeah, Alexa. I'm like sorry. To... I... No, I would love to ask about expanding the story of the person who won the lottery and then let a celebrity. Run I thought it was so fascinating. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was uh, Denmark Vasey. Um, he was enslaved in Haiti and throughout the Caribbean. And, you know, I don't even know how black people were playing the lotto um, in the Caribbean, but they were playing it and apparently he won it uh, and they actually paid him out um, and he bought his freedom and moved to South Carolina. And then he planned the insurrection in South Carolina. Um, and so, you know, I always look at him as a, an amazing figure because, you know, most people, you know, you hit the Powerball today, you're not really planning the next revolution. Like, you know, it's not like really what you do as a as a person that that's that wealthy, right? Um, and can kind of live your life, if you will, um, on your own recognizance as a free individual, but you're still thinking about um, your people, right? Um, and so, again, this was a planned insurrection that did not actually go off. They actually uh, caught it ahead of time um, and executed uh, Denmark Vesey and his conspirators. But the other thing, too, that Denmark Vesey was trying to do is he was trying to commandeer ships to go back to Haiti. Remember that Haiti's already free um, in 18. Um, 04 as the first, you know, free Black Republic uh, in the Western Hemisphere. And so he's trying to take Black people in South Carolina back to Haiti, where he thinks they can kind of live in this Afrofuturistic way, right? This new environment of Black people in a Black-run uh, country. Um, and, and, you know, it's really, it's really a, a powerful story. I think a kind of under-told uh, story um um as well but you know what he really wants to do is 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 really afrofuturist uh to me uh shay yes thank you um <clears throat> excuse me to follow up on that it's interesting about denmark vesey excuse me um that the military school the citadel was created slash established essentially in response by the state um, and with efforts to prevent any future so-called insurrections by enslaved Africans or people of African descent. Um, so that thank you for bringing that up because to unpack Denmark Vesey is, there's a lot to unpack, um, not to mention uh, the AME uh, Zion Church and 
more recent events, tragic events that had occurred there, which ironically, this is the same space um, that he was directly connected with. But um, my question is, does or do uh, any of the Maroons factor into this conversation or this discourse with respect to uh, Afrofuturism uh, being that they had in all the spaces, including Nova Scotia, uh, talking about Canada, I left a, a link in the chat thread about that. Um, does that factor into this discourse at all? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's creating the Black future that you want, right? In these spaces that are aside from kind of the white mainstream, right? On the, you know, so they're in the outer spaces of slavery, but even in the outer spaces, they want to create these zones of Blackness, right, within them. And you, you see this happen, you know, uh, and sometimes even with, you know, like Black schools, these kind of Black safe spaces um, are what these maroon societies uh, are all about, right? And they're all Black ran and they're not controlled or influenced um, by the kind of outside white world. Um, and so, you know, I really look at, you know, the community of St. Catharines as being a Maroon-like community. I can't say it's Maroon altogether, um, but, you know, these Black people are building the, their own color village in St. Catharines, Ontario, right? Um, and when they go to, like, like integrate the schools um, in St. Catharines, the Black people just say, we just want the money um, from the common schools, if you will, the tax money to be applied to our school. We don't actually want to go to school with you, right? I mean, that's very maroon. Like, hey, we don't want to integrate our school. We like our Black teachers. <laughs> we like our students, if you will, be taught by our Black instructors. So just give us our tax money and we'll run the school. Don't worry about us, right? And so that's very maroon-like, right? And that's creating a Black future that these uh, particular individuals want in that community. And I, I find that you know, uh, quite dynamic, right? And quite inspired. All right, we have time for one more question or comment or thought. Can I just ask one last quick question? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I, okay, you keep dropping things on me I've never heard of before. I've never heard of St. Catharines in Ontario. Uh, any resource, just like any resources, books, documentaries, and anything you recommend to learn more about St. Catharines in Ontario? Yeah, um, uh, just my book, really, Borderland Black. <laughs> first, first real major piece that really talks about uh, St. Catharines. Toronto has been highlighted, Hamilton, Ontario. There's a lot of places that have been highlighted, but St. Catharines is quite dynamic because Niagara Falls was kind of like too close to the border and they wanted to be more inland but also too, just the space they build that, that's very like a maroon-like community within the community uh, that Blacks build in St. Catharines. So uh, my book, um, to my knowledge right now, is the only one uh, that really talks about St. Catharines, but I hope that there, there's more in the future. And I, I hope that I'm just uh, setting uh, the table uh, for more you know, Black people studying what uh, Blacks are doing in St. Catharines. Quite dynamic. Thank you. Great, great, great. Uh, um, and and for people that's coming this summer to the Teaching Black History Conference, St. St. Catharines, just, you know, a uh, hop, skip and a jump over the bridge, uh, you know, for you to visit and everything like that. So, of course, I'm going to remind everybody, um, we would love to see you in Buffalo, New York. If you're not in Buffalo, uh, please come to the to to the conference. Please utilize the chat uh, function. When I send the email out, I'll send out the chat um, uh, transcript. You'll see all the different links. Uh, thank you for everyone who participated in um, our second conversation within the chat by giving different links to different resources, uh, different questions. Um, those are highly regarded resources that you have given us for today's topic. Um, any last words, um, Dan, uh, before we get up off? Um, this nerd session no i mean i just appreciate you, you having me back Lagarre. um I, I must have something significant to say i really appreciate the invitation <laughs> dan is a two-time uh person i've invited most people be like dan Lagarre, when i'm gonna have a chance you got dan coming here twice i'm like hey you come down i got you i got everybody that uh wants to participate in nerd sessions but again i appreciate 
I appreciate everyone spending an hour. We're just a bunch of nerds on Saturday morning learning about Black history. And I really appreciate you all um, and everything that that you have um, you know, helped us uh, think through. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about having another Black history nerd session in May. So look out for, for that. I'm kind of finalizing some details for that. I'm, I'm, I'm also thinking about having something for Juneteenth as well. Um, so be on the lookout for that. And then of course our conference in the summer and you know myself, uh, Greg and Donovan, we're gonna go on vacation and relax and don't talk to anybody um, for, for a few months. And then we're gonna come back with some new people like Daphne and uh, Richard and everything like that to, um, um, uh, so we can introduce you all to them as well. So you all have a wonderful time. Do that laundry you all been putting out. Cook some um, lunch for them kids that you've been ignoring for the last hour. Uh, and we'll see you good people next week. Thank you. <laughs>